The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Will you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? Gracious and redeeming Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have created and allowed us to share in and for this Easter season, Lord Jesus, and this resurrection. This morning, Lord, would you take our minds and think through them? Take my lips and speak through them? Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So these last few weeks, we have been traveling from the tomb, the tomb where those first witnesses were in terror and amazement. And we talked about that feeling that God needed us to have to wake us up, our hearts and our minds from the darkness and the sin and pride of our own lives to make us see what had happened in Christ. We see a little bit of that today. They're still startled and terrified. They don't know what's going on. Their brains and their hearts are all over the place. But last week we alluded to there being a transition. After a few days or a week, we can assume as what happens in life after terror and amazement that they started to take a breath or two to relax a little bit, to be more calm, and to begin to process what happened. And in that they found fellowship and they found joy and they begin to understand what exactly it is that Jesus had done on the cross and what this new life was that was coming forth, especially as they began to see him and talk with him and touch him and watch him eat broiled fish. He was there, and there was this new form of life. Last week, I also alluded to this whole process of coming from sin into new life, and I kind of gave that, uh, that image of you know, somebody reaching down, God reaching down into a raging torrent, a, a flooded river. Some of you have seen things like this. Maybe some of you have been in that before. Pulled out and saved from certain death. And the image of God pulling us out of our own lives of sin and death and darkness into this new life that Jesus Christ has offered through his cross, through his love, through his blood. It's a powerful symbol. And by definition, if God has pulled us out of that river, we are now standing on the bank of the river. And we have just come out of this near-death experience. Some of you have had near-death experiences. I have not. But my guess is that if you did have one, more often than not, maybe not everybody, but more often than not, most human beings, if they did have one, don't want to go back into the water. They want nothing to do with that which almost just killed them. My mother, when she was like seven years old, Jersey Shore, riptide. Two miles down the beach, her top torn up, almost died. Seventy some years later, she still doesn't swim in large bodies of water. Why not? Because once she was pulled out of that ocean, she was like, no thank you. And her brain and her perception change. Now, this doesn't always happen. Some people just keep on going. But most of us are like, okay, I learned a lesson. Not only about riptides, but large bodies of water, for me, not good. Most of us in a raging stream or flooded river, we don't want anything to do with it. I'm a really good swimmer. I don't want to go in there. And this image, though, 
This saving image is powerful when we think about it in God's way. The cross is the saving image of God, the love of God in Christ, pulling us onto the bank. And here we stand now with this new opportunity to see differently, to think differently. And the death is dripping on, off of us as the Son of God dries us off into this new life. And we're, we're put forth into this kind of mindset where we're like, how did that happen? Who am I now? Now that I've beat death and sin, now that I've gotten out of that experience, what's it all for? To what end am I saved? Now, this image of being saved pulled up out of the river, you, you've seen this image. Some of you dozens of times. You know where you've seen this image. Just pick a movie. Bridges, buildings, cliffs, helicopters, planes. How many movies is there a life-saving moment where somebody is holding somebody? Now, pause for an aside. Every time I watch one of those movies, it doesn't matter what kind, it's a romance or an action or a thriller, you know what goes through my mind first? There's no way I would be able to hold that person. Maybe Owen, my son, he's 25 pounds. I could do that. My wife's a little... Um, bigger than Owen. She doesn't weigh a lot. I don't think I could hold her, let alone some of these movies where you see somebody holding like a 250 pound person. Are these the world's strongest men and women who do this? And sometimes they're holding two people. Are you crazy? I love you, but I can't do it. It's terrible. But beyond that, what do you see? You see this moment so often. And most of the time, the person is saved and they go on to save the day or something. But this image stuck in my head for one movie. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Now it was supposed to be the last of the three movies, and then they were like, we made so much money, let's make like seven more. They're making the fifth of the sixth one right now, he's like 85 years old. Harrison Ford plays Indiana Jones. If you haven't seen in the movies, he's an archeologist, he goes on these adventures to save stuff. And in The Last Crusade, he and his father, who's played by Sean Connery, are searching for the Holy Grail, the cup of Christ that supposedly, and I forget how the movie explains it, it was the one that gave him water or somebody collected his blood. It doesn't matter. It's got the life of God in it. It's, you know, it's this great archaeological find. And they're on this adventure to find it. Why? Because they're vying against some people who are also trying to find it. Who? Of course, the Nazis. The worst people ever, which by definition makes Harrison Ford everybody's hero. Of course, Harrison Ford. It's Harrison Ford, right? So they're vying, and there's this whole thing in the movie, and at the end, they find where this, this cave, and it's actually in Jordan. It's a beautiful place. Some of you may have been there. And they're in there, and they find that there's this old man in this room, and they have to pick the cup, and it's like that wizard moment with the three questions. And they get the cup, Indiana Jones trying to save his dad, who the Nazis have shot, and this Nazi woman, stereotypical blonde, blue eyes, whatever, and they've got the cup. They've got the cup of Christ, the holy grail of archaeology. Now, you know why the Nazis wanted it? Power. If every Nazi could drink from the cup, they'd be invincible, and they could take over the world. You know why Indiana Jones wants it? Because he wants to put it in a museum. <laughs> Neither of them are Christian, which is ironic. <laughs> But they get it. And the old man tells them as they're about to walk out, but the cost of eternal life is you can't take it from the cave. What? You can't take it from the cave, you just can't. So they go and they're leaving and, and they're kind of all excited that they found the cup and Indiana Jones saves his dad by pouring the water and, he, and he's healed and all that. And then Elsa takes the cup. Elsa's the German Nazi woman. And she is like, so lost in the cup, she starts walking towards the exit. And there's a cross seal on there. And the guy had said, if you cross the seal, things will happen. You won't get it. And Indiana's like, Elsa, don't cross the seal. The guy told us you can't do that. And she does it anyway, because all she wants is the power and the glory of the cup. And she wants to get out of that, that place right now and just go be glorious with the cup of Christ. And what happens? Earthquake. Remember a couple weeks ago? The earthquake that woke us up 
that shook us to see the truth of the cross and resurrection? Is there an earthquake? And the floor splits, and Elsa falls down into this crevice. The cup of Christ out of her hand goes down another few feet, and she's falling, and guess what happens? Indiana Jones. Now, I'm guessing this is a really bad guess because I know you don't talk about ladies and their weight. She's 120, 130. I wouldn't be able to do it. He's Indiana Jones, though. He saves the day. He's got her. He's like, Elsa, you got to give me your hand, darling, or whatever he says. I can't pull you with one arm. Somebody actually admits they can't do it. They need help, right? All she's doing is looking at the cup. All she's thinking about is what that cup can do for me and for the Nazis. And so you see her straining with this wild look in her eyes. I'm so close, I can get it. And he's like, I can't hold you. (laughs) Disappears into the chasm. Another rumbling, and Indiana Jones now slips down into the same exact position, and guess what happens again? (laughs) Slightly more unbelievable because I'm guessing Indiana Jones weighs at least 100 pounds more than Elsa does, and Sean Connery's like 80, nothing against older gentlemen or ladies, but come on, I don't think I could hold a person 220 pounds, okay? And I already have arthritis in my 40s. But he does it, and he's got Indiana Jones, and Indiana has the same effect. The eyes staring at the cup, we can get it. It's right here. What we could, we could save it would be this great piece of history that we would have a hand in. And Sean Connery knows. He just saw this woman die trying to do the same thing. And there's this like pause in the noise. And his voice changes. And he goes, Indiana, let it go. There's about a second or two beat. And you can see and hear that Indiana has heard the father of his loving, the loving father's voice. Something woke up inside of him, and he goes, oh, what's more important than this cup which can bring me worldly glory and history and all that is the love of my father who is pulling me out of the chasm. And he takes his eyes off the cup and offers his other hand, and his dad pulls him out and saves him. And then you know what they do? They ride off into the sunset, literally, to go on another adventure. But you see what happened? Where were their eyes? If you read through the scriptures today in your bulletin, now or at home, every one of them mentions something about seeing, seeing the works of God, seeing what Jesus did, seeing the revelation. Why? Because human beings are visual creatures, even more so in this generation. What we look at and what we gaze at and what we're fixated on becomes who we are. So if you want that cup, that's all you're going to look at, and you're going to forget about who's trying to save you. Last week, we alluded to this idea of star and celebrity in our world and how new religions and seculosities create this fervor in us because we don't find the faith of Jesus, so we go out in the world to find the saving faith or to find purpose and worth. And there's something interesting about stars and celebrities because by definition, stars are bright. What do we do when we see a star? The brighter the star, the more power it has, figuratively and literally. Look at the way that our culture in particular worships stardom. People on TV, on social media, you know what I'm talking about. All of us on some level are guilty of it, and that's okay. We'll get to that part. We watch them, and then in between, as we're watching, guess what the world figured out? The world figured out if we can get them to stare at a screen to see this perfectly beautiful person with this perfect car and this perfect skin and these perfect pieces of plastic body and this hill in the Malibu Hills, this house in the Malibu Hills, then guess what? Once they're staring, once they're fixated, once their eye is on the cup, I can put other stuff in front of their eyes. I can sell them stuff subliminally or otherwise. You want the makeup that she has, don't you? You want that fancy suit that he's wearing in James Bond, don't you? I know you want that that Aston Martin. I know you want the Botox or whatever else it is that changes our shape and our skin tone to look like the movie stars. 
And again, I'm not faulting us for some of this. The idea of seculosity and religions outside of the faith of Christ is that if we begin to worship those things for their own power instead of Jesus, there's a problem. But you see how that happens. And we gaze at these people and we want to be these people. Do you remember in the 90s? The best marketing slogan ever, the person who came up with it better be a billionaire, Nike Air Jordans, do you remember the slogan? Be like Mike. If you just buy his shoes and his clothes, you can be like Mike. No, you cannot. I have a 10 inch vertical. I'm 6'4", I can't dunk. Getting Air Jordans is not gonna get me to dunk, let alone be able to play Mike Mike, because he's the best basketball player ever in creation. But you start to think, I could be like Mike. If I have his shoes and his jumpsuit, and if I watch his game all the time, and then you're invested, then you're in the crevice, and then your eyes are on that prize, and I'm gonna be like Mike, I'm gonna watch every game, and all the commercials, I'm gonna buy all of his products, Nike's gonna make trillions of dollars, and I'm just gonna keep my eye right here. You know the problem with this? You know what the problem with star and celebrity and reality TV shows and social media and influencers, do you know what the problem is? Is we want to be like them so much that we stare and fixate and behold them and while we're looking at the cup, we have forgotten the saving salvation that is ripping us out of that torrent. We're not looking at the voice that is calling us in love. We're not reaching our hand up to Jesus because we want what the world is trying to give us. Behold, the world is of the devil. Today, the words of John in his gospel, in his first epistle, say this. See what love the Father has given us. That word see is actually behold. See, right now I see you. I'm not beholding you. Beholding is like, boom. Right? The beginning of a play or the beginning of a movie. That boom, I got you. That beholding, it's magnanimous. It's awesome. It's majestic. Behold what has happened in front of you. Behold, see, gaze, fixate, look at this. Stop looking at the cup. Stop looking at the stars. Look at the love of the Father that he has given us, that we should be called children of God. You see what he wants us to watch. Do you know where the love of God is so that you can see it? Right there. Some of us, you are wearing it on your necks or in your ears. Some of you have your house. We have it all over the church. I have one in every single room in my house. This is the love of God. Self-sacrificial service to all humans. Behold and see the love of God. But he didn't just say, I love you, right? He gave us love. If I give you something, you by definition now what? You have it. It's infused in your, in your being, which means by faith, the love of God has filled us. He has given it to us. It's part of our life. He has reached down with his hand bloody in the water and pulled us from it in his love. And we stand on the bank and we go, oh my God, he loves me. And you feel it and you change your life and you go, what do I do now? Who am I now? Behold, the love of God given by the Father, we are children of God. All of us in faith in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, by definition, given the love of God, which flows through our veins, what happens when you have veins flowing blood? You know whose blood flows in my son, mine, and Bethany's? When you have the blood of the father and the mother, you, by definition, become the child of that. Now let's be clear about something. Many of you have heard people in the world, people down here looking at the cup, you've heard them say that phrase, haven't you? We're all what? Children of God. But you know when you usually hear that in the context, you hear it in the context of we're all children of God, we all deserve respect and love, and whatever happened to that person or didn't happen, it should have been better because they're children of God. And guess what? That's right. It's true. To an extent. By creation, 
in God's image, with the seed of that within us, we are, in effect, creatures, creation, children of God. But that's not what John is talking about. John and Paul talk about the children of God as the children who have been pulled from the torrent of death and sin and are now free from that. People who say we are children of God don't mean it negatively. They are totally right on. But they are so down here stuck in the world that they forget they have been given this magnificent, wonderful gift that makes them actual, adopted, blessed children of God. By their faith in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And only by that. Not by any other religion. I'm sorry to say that. It's true. Only in Christianity, only in Jesus, did God come down, die, give us his love, and then pull us from the river in resurrected life. No other religion does that. None. I'm going to say something that some of you are going to be very uncomfortable with. By definition, that makes every other religion false. Doesn't mean you have to hate those people or denigrate them or speak badly to them. But in your hearts, you need to hear it from your pastor. Those are not true religions because none of them did this. None of them have the life giving power of Jesus Christ on the cross through resurrection. None of them. Which means everybody who doesn't follow Jesus in faith has still remained in the river, is still being led to the cup and to the shiny things and to the stars. I need a breath. Some of us right now are saying, but Charlie, I still sin. Of course you do. He pulled us out of that original sin and cleansed us. But if you hear in Acts today, what does he say? Forgiveness and repentance. He knows that we're going to keep sinning, and he goes, I love you, I forgive you, and I know it's going to keep happening. So come, come to me, repent of your sin, and I will what? Forgive you. But if we don't recognize that we're in the river, if we're stuck looking at what's in the world, guess what? I'm not going to look to see who's saving me and forgiving me. I say this all the time. 99.9% .9 of the problems in this world are created because of sin. The division and vitriol and hatred in this country is based on sin. You can say other words, but it all goes back to sin. Because all of us are in the river at some point in our lives trying to get power and glory from that cup, from that shiny thing, from that thing the world says is better. And guess what we are not looking at? We're not beholding the safety and trust and love of God and the cross. And in that, John tells us something even more amazing as I wind down here. The reason the world does not know us, because they're all in the river and we've been pulled out, Think about that. If you're in a flooding river, are you noticing the people in the bank? No. Is that it did not know him. Their eyes are not on Jesus. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. Not like Mike. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him, purify themselves just as he is pure. Two final things. We have a hope. Why do we have a hope? Because he did pull us out in our faith. We got out of the river of sin and death. He calls us children of God. What is the definition of a child who is alive? Do they stay children forever? No. They grow up and mature. By definition, that means that we grow and we aren't children someday, which means there is a future, which means there is a hope. The hope for eternity is that we've been pulled out of the river. We're not in the river anymore. But we now have the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the blessedness of God flowing through us to make us children, pulled out of the river by the cross and love of Jesus Christ. And that also means something else amazing that none of us like to even imagine is true, that in that process, we are being purified, not only by the blood of Christ, but by our daily work against sin itself, that God has given us the strength now to fight. We're not flailing trying to survive in the river. We're standing here in the light of Christ, in the power of Christ, and God says, don't sin. And we all have a choice. You can keep sinning, but when you do, you are not in Christ. 
God has given us the strength every day to battle it in every single one of us, you and I, and you out there, every day is a battle of sin. Does Jesus forgive them? Yep, but we still have to battle them, which is why it says you have to purify yourselves. Because as the Holy Spirit works through us, as the Holy Scripture leads us and guides us, as our worship, our baptism, as the Eucharist fills us with the power, the strength, and the being of God, we have the ability to say no. Because we're not looking in the river anymore. We're looking at the cross of Jesus, and we know that sin has been overcome. And so we have the ability to say, I'm good. Thank you. I don't need that anymore. Behold, the love of God from the Father, which makes us children of God. Behold that you have been forgiven. Behold your new life in Christ. Behold and know that each day that you live in faith, you, yes you, sitting there, right there in your imperfection and your still ongoing sin, are a child of God. Not the world's child of God that's all nice and fluffy and whatever, but the true child of God who will grow and mature in Christ and receive a crown and glory in heaven so that one day we will not only see him, but we will be like him forever and ever. Amen.